Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Vincent Price. Casablanca, Marrakesh, Tangier, and Rabat, the four imperial cities of Morocco. Imagine a culture that needed four imperial cities instead of a single capital. The northern tip of Morocco almost touches Spain, and Morocco is accordingly Mediterranean. The North Africans themselves refer to Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya as the Maghreb, or the West, a place apart. These countries have been profoundly influenced by both Muslim and Roman cultures. The Romans commandeered Morocco before the birth of Christ, and civilization rose and fell until the Moroccans received independence in 1956. Well, enough boring history. With all Morocco's cultural input from other countries, her cuisine is unique. It has a distinctly Mideastern flavor with touches of Spain. The foods are at once alarmingly simple, and yet some are incredibly complex. Even the most complex preparations have simple beginnings, and so will our Moroccan meal. The Moroccans themselves are Muslims and hence do not drink alcohol. But fortunately, France has left her imprint along with Spain and we do have vineyards in Morocco. I also remember grove after grove of oranges, each shining like a globe of light against their dark green leaves. Lambs dot the hillsides like snowy clouds and hives of bees cluster in the fields. Morocco may be on the edge of the great deserts, but she utilizes her land religiously. And so, to our simple beginning. An austere beginning. Well, <laughs> simple anyway. And it's often the best introduction for a sumptuous feast. I sometimes like to tease my guests' appetite instead of filling them before dinner. Our Moroccan dinner will have such rich and unusual foods that I feel this kind of a simple beginning is almost mandatory. In Moroccan homes, tea would be served before the meal, or in non-Muslim homes, perhaps a, a very dry sherry or a light rosé, in honor of the Spanish and French influences. The tea before dinner would be unsweetened, so we won't dull our palates and satiate our appetites. With our little aperitif, the nicest combination is a selection of black and green olives and salted almonds. Nothing could be simpler to prepare. The care comes in our shopping, leaving us free for other concerns when our guests are with us. I always buy large black olives because I feel they should be showy and the green olives stuffed with pimentos. The almonds can be served two ways. Traditionally, a basket of unshelled almonds with a nutcracker would be placed on a low brass table with cushions all around it. I usually use the coffee table, and if I have an adventurous group, we sit around on piles of pillows. The low seats and the cracking of nuts and sipping of tea or sherry give the dinner party a, a most provocative beginning. And then I always lower the lights and burn lots of candles to help create a, a more exotic atmosphere. If you're worried about cracking the almonds, a, a bowl of shelled nuts can be substituted with no problems. I, however, prefer letting my guests work a little. It actually is rather fun and can help break those first awkward moments of a party. I always enjoy the contrast of textures and flavors. Foods interplay into an almost contrapuntal whole. Crisp against soft, bland opposed to spicy, each making its own statement, yet all part of a greater whole. Our first main course is an adaptation of a Moroccan classic, pastilla, or a pigeon pie. Due to the lack of availability of pigeons, we will substitute chicken. The Moroccan cuisine leans heavily on fowl because they are easier to support in a desert culture. So our pastilla takes paper-thin layers of crispy phyllo dough, poached chicken, exotic herbs, nuts, a bit of honey, and a, a touch of my own cream cheese. 
The chicken should first be poached, as I said. Now, you can use whatever parts you prefer. I usually buy a whole bird or fryer parts for economy's sake. The chicken is one of the best protein buys of today, and it's so versatile. Usually, I use an enamel pot to poach the chicken. I actually should say simmer the chicken because that's what we do. Early in the day or even the day before, I place the chicken pieces in the pot and barely cover them with water, and then I add a splash of whatever wine happens to be open, at least a quarter of a cup of red, white, or rosé, one or two whole cloves, two tablespoons full of salt, and two tablespoons of minced dehydrated onions, and that adds some interest to the pot. Now, you heat the chicken and the liquid until it boils, and then cover it tightly and lower the temperature until the bubbles seem lazy. This can be safely ignored for two and a half hours. I want the chicken to fall off the bone and be meltingly tender. I allow the chicken to cool in the broth because that keeps it moist and juicy. I then strain off the chicken stock and skin and bone the meat. I always save the stock in the refrigerator or freeze it into cubes. It makes a superb addition to homemade soup or gravies. And now we should have a, a lovely pile of juicy, dark, and light chicken meat. What a nice beginning. I next saute a cup of chopped blanched almonds in a cube of melted butter. I add a finely chopped onion after two minutes and saute everything until it turns pale gold. This takes about uh, six minutes, and I always stir it constantly. This is no time for inattention. And when this is done, I merely stir in the chicken and set it all aside. I then melt a cube of butter and open my package of thawed phyllo pastry sheets or strudel dough. These are available in many supermarkets carrying gourmet items or in mid-European or mid-Eastern delicatessens. I find I sometimes have to do some detective work for more exotic ingredients, but it's always worth the trouble. As a matter of fact, it's a lot of fun. I brush my pan with melted butter. I usually make my pastilla in a 12-inch iron skillet, but any large, low, round, oven-proof pan or dish will be suitable. I then put down a sheet of phyllo and let it hang over the edges. I then brush it with butter and keep on rotating the pan and adding sheets till there is a layer of 12 buttered sheets in my pan with a nice overhanging border of dough all around. Then I spread on the chicken, almonds, and onion and sprinkle them with a scant teaspoon of powdered cinnamon. I now take two 8-ounce packages of cream cheese from the refrigerator and cut it into small cubes and cover the chicken, nuts, and onion mixture with the cream cheese. Then we bring up the edges of the dough all around and use the melted butter to stick them together. It works very much like glue on the thin pastry. I then add six or more layers of dough on the top. I generally cut these layers to fit the pan with a pair of scissors. The dough cuts like paper, by the way, and of course more butter goes between each layer and then we brush the whole pastilla with the rest of the butter. Now the pastilla can either be baked or stored tightly covered in the refrigerator. It can be made a full day ahead with no problems at all. I bake it at 370 degrees for 40 minutes and then turn the oven up to 400 degrees for six minutes to turn the pastilla a golden brown. When the pastilla is done, I very carefully turn it over on a large round platter. This is why I use a skillet. The handle helps in this part of the operation. And then to garnish our pastilla, I sprinkle it heavily with a powdered sugar and dust it lightly with cinnamon. And it should be pulled from the oven, garnished, and served as quickly as possible. I cut it into wedges like a pie. The filling runs a bit, but if you work quickly, it won't be a problem. The best way is to approach the pastilla firmly and with confidence, because after all, you made it. 
A chilled rosé is a great accompaniment for this dish. It sets just the right note against the crisp, subtly spiced, and rich pastilla. One of my guests once said on tasting my pastilla, I'm eating a poem. Well, I think maybe she was right. <laughs> now, if you can't find phyllo dough, don't miss this dish. Merely make your flakiest pie crust and bake this as a two-crusted pie, sprinkling it with the sugar and cinnamon as you would have done with the phyllo dough. Believe me, it's far too good to miss. Try it. After a dish as rich as the pastilla, our palates are sadly in need of refreshment. The salad performs this task for us delightfully. It's amazing how much excitement a fresh, crisp salad can generate after a rich course. I buy two large heads of romaine for our Moroccan salad. It has a delicate flavor, and the shade of green is just right, very beautiful. I, of course, try to shop for my salad greens early on the day of the party because freshness is the keynote here. I then wash the romaine, shake it as dry as possible, and refrigerate it until the last possible moment. I use oranges in this salad and peeled cucumbers because they taste so fresh and cool, and the mild acidity of the orange perks up everyone's appetite all over again. So we peel, slice, and seed two large oranges and cut them into pieces. And then we peel and thinly slice a cucumber. And that's the salad. I then prepare a very simple dressing, and there you have it. Now, I usually bring out a tray with my salad dressing ingredients in cruets and make the dressing in front of my guests and toss the salad in front of them, too. It's a welcome break in the routine of the meal, and since we eat with our eyes, why not have a little show? For the dressing, I use a quarter of a cup of olive oil, good olive oil, and one-third a cup of lemon juice, two tablespoons of honey, one teaspoon of salt and pepper, and two tablespoons of poppy seeds. I stir it in all together in a silver bowl vigorously with a whisk and pour it on the romaine, oranges, and cucumbers, and then toss it well. I always chill my salad plates in the freezer so the salad stays nicely chilled throughout the meal. The Moroccans serve pretty little loaves of anise-flavored bread with their salads. These can be achieved by a judicious shortcut. I buy frozen bread dough and thaw it till it's room temperature and quite pliable. Then I knead in one teaspoon of crushed anise seeds or powdered anise and four to six tablespoons full of sugar. I then separate the dough into balls about the size of ping pong balls and pile three or four of them into well buttered custard cups. And then after they've doubled in size, I bake them. They take about 25 minutes at 375 degrees. I serve them right out of the oven with crocks of sweet butter and honey. The licorice loaves are a startling but very pleasant contrast to the cold, crisp salad. After the salad has been consumed, everybody is wondering what on earth could come next. So we work more kitchen magic. Chicken tahin. The name comes from the cooking vessel, the tahin, a large earthware pot. I, however, use my electric skillet. It makes life much simpler. First, you heat one half cup of oil in the electric skillet, and then you brown two chickens cut into pieces. When the chicken is browned, remove it to paper towels, and then add to the skillet one and a half cups of blender chopped onions. Stir this well until all the brown bits are dissolved and then add a quarter of a cup of white wine. I then cut two lemons into eighths, seed them and add them to the onions plus one tablespoonful of salt and one tablespoonful of paprika. I stir this and bring it to a slow simmer and then add the chicken pieces. 
I cook this at 250 degrees for three hours and then remove the chicken and add 36 small green pitted and stuffed olives and boil the sauce until it's reduced slightly and thickened. I then pour the sauce over the chicken and serve it, or it can be held in the oven. Tightly covered at about 200 degrees until it's needed. I like to serve this with brown rice. The Moroccans would serve a grain preparation called couscous. It's a beautiful dish, but it even taxes my patience. And the most frustrating thing was that most people have no idea of the effort involved. So after several experiences in being the unsung hero of the kitchen, I transferred to brown rice. Brown rice is not brown, but a beautiful pale tan. It's much healthier because the skin remains on the rice, and that's where all the vitamins are carried. Besides all that, it has an intriguing nutty flavor that white rice never hopes to achieve. I usually buy the quick cooking brown rice or converted brown rice because it's easier to handle. I use the leftover broth from our pastilla plus additional water for the liquid. I then just cook it according to the instructions on the package. If you want to add an even nicer touch, I saute the rice in two to three tablespoons full of butter before I cook it with the liquid. This seems to bring out the nutty flavor even more. The rice and tahine can be served separately, but I like to pile the chicken pieces on the, on the bed of brown rice on a large, hot platter. I sprinkle the chicken lightly with paprika and arrange the lemon wedges around the edge. I pass the extra sauce in a gravy boat. I also serve a, a rosé wine with the chicken. It stands up to the lemons and olives better than a lighter white wine. And the color is a consideration also, for the pale pink is a lovely contrast to the food. I encourage my guests to eat the chicken with their fingers. The Moroccans would eat the couscous with their fingers too, using the thumb and first two fingers of their right hand. Well, none of my guests ever had nimble enough fingers to roll the hot rice in a ball and pop it into their mouths. I'm afraid that my carpets suffered terribly. So now I supply silverware. But after this course in Morocco, we would be handed steaming bowls of perfumed water and towels. I alter this custom slightly and bring out a tray of steaming rolled up washcloths sprinkled with rose water or orange flower water. It's remarkably refreshing and a welcome surprise. After this sumptuous repast, everyone wonders what on earth can be for dessert. Something light and refreshing is necessary, even vital. I would choose a, a sorbet or a sherbet to end the meal. This has roots far deeper in antiquity than we realize the emperors used to send runners across the desert into the mountains to run back with containers of snow, which were laced with fruit juices and honey to provide refreshing ices or, or drinks to drink after a huge feast. After a meal like this, I, I feel compelled to follow their lead, so I serve a sherbet, though you don't have to run for it. There are some very good commercial sherbets available, but I like to make my own. So here's a champagne lemon ice. I cook two cups of champagne with three quarters of a cup of sugar slowly at a low simmer for about 10 minutes, then cool it. I next add a half cup of fresh lemon juice, one quarter teaspoon of almond extract, and the grated rind from the lemons plus one sixteenth of a teaspoonful of salt. We next pour this into ice cube trays and freeze it till it's almost firm. This generally takes about one and a half hours. I then remove the semi-solid mixture from the freezer and beat it in a chilled mixing bowl with the electric beater until it's very smooth. I then quickly fold in two stiffly beaten egg whites and cover the sherbet with wax paper and pop the mixture back into the freezer. 
Now, this can be done a day ahead of the dinner. I usually allow it to soften in the refrigerator for about 20 or 30 minutes before I serve it. I then present the sherbet in goblets because they really look very festive. I generally accompany the sherbet with a simple cookie. What I do is I buy frozen pastry shells and allow them to thaw and roll out the dough slightly with a rolling pin. I then cut it into triangles about four inches long and two inches wide. I brush the dough with melted butter and sprinkle it with a half a cup of chopped walnuts and one teaspoon of cinnamon plus a half a cup of sugar. I then roll up the triangles with the sugar and nuts inside and bake them until they puff and are golden brown. That takes about 20 minutes. I cool them and I hide them because they're so good they never last until the party. No meal is complete without the final touch and Moroccans have a superb one. They serve piping hot sweet mint tea. I just brew a pot of tea and I add a quarter of a teaspoon of peppermint extract to it. Now, you can add more or less extract depending on your taste. I then sweeten the tea with four tablespoons full of sugar. This is best served in demitas cups in small doses. A large cup of this tea is, is really too overpowering. Well, now we have dined Moroccan style, a meal worthy of Casablanca's finest. Visions of whitewashed buildings, palm trees, and desert vistas should dance in our dreams after a meal like this.